So welcome to Famous When I'm Dead, where professional creators share with you the tools so you can thrive while you're still alive. I'm your host, Sam King Davis, and today we have a very special guest from the middle of the U.S., aside from a caricature artist, illustrator, graphic facilitator. He also has one of the best telescopes out there, and... <laughs> I give you Corey Hubble. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. I am truly honored to have been asked to be on here. I feel a little bit like Garth and Wayne from Wayne's World when they when they meet Alice Cooper backstage and they're like, we're not worthy. <laughs> uh, when I think about some of the guests you've had on, but thanks a lot, man. This is, uh, yeah, yeah. is going to be fun. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, so why don't we start off talking about that, like what we talked about, about... Uh, the question that you had right before we started, like the graphic facilitation, about graphic facilitation. Yeah, so, you know, I know you've had a lot of caricature artists on, and that is very much how I got my start and, and first started hustling and being a, uh, I guess, participant in the gig economy. Um, but I was just asking you, like, what's the best way for me to bring your listeners um, the greatest value is it to sort of lean into the caricature thing, which I still very much do, um, or this other interesting field that I've discovered along the way um, in corporate America, which is that of graphic facilitation and that whole world. So yeah, I was just kind of, for the purposes of scoping our conversation, didn't know if you had a preference on where I leaned, but I'm happy to talk to either. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to talk a little bit actually about the story branding thing and the the hero's journey because uh, once I learned about that, it kind of I'm always looking for it now. Like any movie yeah. that I watch, I'm like, okay, who's the hero? Who's the mentor? Who's the you know? Exactly, man. I when I first heard about that, um, well, the book by uh, Donald Miller. But then, you know, how he bases a lot of that concept off of Joseph Campbell's work in, in A Hero's Journey. And you, you do, you start looking for it everywhere in storytelling. But then as a business owner, an entrepreneur, you start looking at it and like, oh, am I falling victim to the old way of thinking, which is to present myself as the hero? Yeah. Or am I the guide? Am I, am I somebody else's Obi-Wan? And so I've challenged myself with my freelance work uh, with Hubble Arts to make sure that I'm empowering others story or helping them to tell their story as opposed to look how great I am. That's yeah. pretty much how I'm wired anyway. So it, it it's like it, a principle, the principle of above the personality. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to say it. And then there's the, also how it applies to your own life, you know, like, yeah. At what point, at what point am I the hero? At what point am I the mentor? And what, at what point am I the villain? You know? <laughs> yeah. That's getting psychological. You could do a lot of, you know, check up from the neck up type work asking yourself those questions. Yeah, I mean, that there is something that came up yesterday with, uh, eh, let's call him like one of my advisors. And um, he's got this blend of um, Christian Gnosticism, uh, mm -hmm. Buddhism, and um, kind of like recovery work. And... Mm -hmm. I thought I was getting pretty deep with this this thing I was feeling about like uh, I was feeling like a lot of grief and it, it kind of felt like uh, parts of my ego were dying off. My my wife and I are gonna have a, a our first child, so it's like bringing. Oh, up congrats, that. man! Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. And uh, so I brought that up to him, and then he's just like, "Well, um, how about this? How about anatta, which is the Buddhist principle of non-self? You know, he's mm -hmm. like." He's like, this part of you that's dying off, why are you automatically trying to replace that part? You know, why can't you just let that part of your ego die off? And then what happens wow. when, like, all of these characters, you know, like, our egos are made up of all of these characters, like the good husband, the 
the brother, the son, the American, the businessman, the, 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 you know, the spiritual guy, like we have all of these things that construct like how we identify ourselves, but really they're just constructions. They're like stories that we're telling ourselves. you know? Yeah. We love our labels, don't we? <laughs> yeah. I actually watched an interview with Noah Camp, who's a awesome 3D, 3D letter artist. And like I watched the intro when I was doing the editing and I, I labeled myself like 10 different ways. I'm like, oh, that's, that's why I didn't even identify myself except for as the host. <laughs> well, the world is so used to it. And, and we, we want to make our snap judgments about people. And so we need to put them in a category for our own processing. And then in order to like honor that or adapt to that, that's how we introduce ourselves so you go down the list of all the things that you are. I just watched In and of Itself on Hulu, which is, if you've not seen it, Derek Del Gaudio is a illusionist. And it's this one man play that he did for 500 some odd shows in, in New York City. I can't even describe it without like giving it away. Just if you have Hulu, check out In and of Itself. But that's how it starts. What's, what's the asks, guy's name? Derek Del Gaudio. And um, he's a sleight of hand artist and illusionist, but he's also a phenomenal storyteller. But anyway, that's how people would come into the play that night. They would pick a label from a wall and he ties that into the message of it. Just like shut your phone off, give yourself an hour and a half, sit down and watch that. It is a sensory experience end to end. But but a lot of it is based on identity and, and um, it's it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, I could go sounds... off on a whole on a whole rabbit trail about that. Yeah, that sounds pretty awesome. Well, let's let's go back. I don't have Hulu, but I will uh, I will look that out. I, I noted that for sure. Yeah. But uh, let's go back and start kind of with your call to action. Maybe like we know yeah. we know that you grew up in the middle of the U.S. Yeah. Now you're in your middle age. You yeah. co-host on the podcast from the middle. Yeah. Now, but but let's go back to the beginning, or at least like the call to action. And yeah, what was that like? So you know, I'll I'll continue with the analogy of of Star Wars that's used in the book, uh, building a story brand. And I felt very similar to Luke. I'm in this very small town. I grew up in a town of three thousand people, where everybody was primarily blue collar or farmer, and had this natural love of art and drawing and. Um, you didn't see a lot of people who left our town to pursue a field in art, maybe as a hobby, um, but definitely not as a full-time uh, gig. And, and uh, somewhere around, I mean, I had very supportive parents who encouraged that. My dad started collecting everything I drew from kindergarten onward and put it in a book. And cool. so like, they, I don't know if they saw something or they just wanted to fuel that, that passion in me, but, um, that's kind of where it started. And then as cheesy as it sounds, I saw a banner in my school in junior high that said, if you find a job you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Oh, yeah. I can feel the cheese melting off of that one. Oh, yeah. Isn't <laughs> it? It's just it's ripe with cheese. But I was just like, that was for real. As cheesy as it sounds, that was the first time that I ever put it together in my brain. Well, you love this art thing. What if that became the thing you hear talk of people talking about what they're going to do when they get out of here. And, uh, and I started to put it together. I had a extremely supportive art teacher, Gary Wells, and he, he encouraged that. And I think he sensed some natural abilities in me and was like, I'm going to help you build a portfolio for art school. Like gotta, starting in junior high. I got to give a shout out to my uh, high school art teacher, Miss Manley. Thanks, Miss Manley. Yeah. I love you. <laughs> But seriously, had it not been for, you know, supportive parents and, and people that believed in me, um, I don't I think I would have just succumbed to the whatever the guidance counselor said, which was like, maybe you become an architect or an engineer or because mm -hmm. you see the world, you know, more visually. Um, and not that that would not have been great, but I think a little piece of me would have always longed for um, drawing and, and the creation of, of imagery and, and storytelling. So. Um, that's kind of how it started. And then in high school, there was an upperclassman, Patrick O'Connell. This will bring it back to the caricature side. He had been trained by, um, uh, in the Cedar Point, Six Flags, uh, Cayman's Art Shops was the name of the umbrella company that trained mm -hmm. a lot of those guys. 
And he he was doing that. And I saw his stuff and I for the first time appreciated line weight. I fell in love with line weight yeah, and thick yeah. and thin. For me, up until that point, everything was one thickness of line. And that's how you achieved image making. And I was yeah. like, oh my gosh. And if you look at my work today, you could see that I've never, I never let go of that love of line weight. And, uh, but Patrick said, hey, that's such why a, don't we it's go so to funny. Local? It's like such a specific thing to nerd out on. It's like, I do I the know. same thing. I like, absolutely <laughs> fell in love with it. Um, yeah. So he was like, hey, man, why don't we go to like the local restaurants and talk to the management? And so that we don't have to get a vendor's license, because in the state of Ohio, you need a vendor's license to to get paid in public for doing any type of service. Um, he's like, let's just work off of tips. So here I am, a high schooler. And on Friday nights and Saturday nights, we'd go to our Texas Roadhouse was the restaurant chain in the nearest town. And we would just sit in the lobby while people were waiting on tables and do caricatures for tips. And as high schoolers walk away with a couple hundred bucks a night. Yeah. So now I'm going, so now I'm going, wait a minute, I can take a Dixon Marquette marker in a ream of 12 by 18 paper and go make a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. And it's just me just like young Corey starting to like put all this together. Um, And then I did the art school thing and whatever. So that was probably the initial sort of call it call to action or call it me starting to connect some wires that for others may have never been connected. And I'm realizing like, Oh, this is cool. Were this, you guys this... around the same age or what? Yeah, he was like a year or two ahead of me in school. So he was he was the mentor. Enter enter mentor. Yeah. Enter mentor enter mentor number one or two, right? Because you had Gary Wells, you had Patrick O'Connell. And that that will be a theme in the rest of my story. Like if I've done anything well, I'm not the best artist, especially when I consider some of the, the guests you've had, like I'm not the best painter. I can draw all day long, but I'm not I'm not a great painter. Um, but I have consistently at every phase of my journey put myself around people who were in life were in life where I wanted to be mm-hmm. and just asked a crap ton of questions. That's I mean, a that's the combination of those two things. That's like um I just want to highlight that mark right there as a tool, you know, because we say that we are empowering artists by giving them tools that they can use like practical tools. And that is, that's a huge one. Like always putting yourself in front of someone who is better at you than something and just ask, 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 ask. Yeah. I think I heard questions that seem stupid, like even the ones that make you feel stupid to ask. Yeah. I think I heard you talk about it as, um, you know, throwing yourself in the shark pool, you know, like just get around the best of the best that you can. And, um, well, and it's I like guess that's maybe, maybe it was the analogy was, uh, the way they ship salmon. Like when they ship salmon across a long, um, land area, they mm-hmm. put like, um, a territorial fish in with the salmon because mm-hmm. otherwise they just flop around. And by the time they get there, they'd be soft. So that, yeah. keep, that fish keeps them moving all the time. Yeah. I think it's, regardless, it's that rising tide raises all boats analogy. You know, we'll probably use a, a hundred vis- visual metaphors over the course of this interview. But um, that's, and that's part of probably what shaped me ultimately deciding to go to a prestigious art college instead of just what everybody else said, which was like, yeah, just do your first two years, all your base level courses here in our little small town, and then maybe go chase that art thing. But I just felt a strong pull to get around the best of the best. And at the time, you know, Chris Payne was at uh, CCAD as an adjunct professor, and we would they would bring in like James Bennett and all these master caricature artists who, you know, they'd be working on a Time Magazine cover in class as their demo. <laughs> And you're like, I'm I'm literally sitting at the feet of the best in this in this industry right now. And so that that was hugely formative for me. Um, but I've always been that way. It's always just like I'm I'm smart enough to know I'm not smart enough. And I just want to get around guys doing it and just ask a ton of questions, even if they're really, really stupid. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that lack of the Dunning Kruger effect is important. It's important that people know about that. So for the listeners, if you don't know about that, look that up because I, I suffer from that in areas too. Like I have to try and keep myself 
uh, conscious about that because for whatever reason, I don't know if it's to prop up my self-esteem or whatever, but I, I, I definitely, there's areas where I, I'll learn the basics of it. And because I know if I, I think it's because I know if I sat down and learned it, I would get it fairly quickly that I just think, oh yeah, I could do that. And I just bl- blow yeah. it off like that instead of saying, no, like I need to start with the basics. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a great way to think about it. Another thing so is that kind of people... go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so that kind of gets me to college and being surrounded by uh, other illustrators. That's where I met Chance McGee, who you had on. And yeah, so yeah. we have a mutual friend of Chance. And um, and I, I could tell, like, he was a guy who, you know, loves caricature. And, you know, it was him and I that would, like, go around Columbus and try to find places that would let us do caricatures of the people at their restaurants that were waiting on oh, tables. Oh, that was or... Chance? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that was... Okay, cool. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it was always just like trying to be around where the buzz was for the thing that you were interested in. And it, at that time, it was caricature and illustration. And then maybe a controversial thing to even suggest on your podcast because of, you know, how many caricature artists that you had on, but... That's where I met A.G. Ford, who is now a New York Times bestselling children's book illustrator. Mm. We had him on our podcast a few weeks ago and had a great interview. But when we were in college, we loved caricature and we were, you know, sitting at the feet, like I said, of of Chris Payne and, and James Bennett. And, you know, we were studying like Tom Richmond and all these like masters of caricature. And that's when he asked, he challenged us, the little group of guys that were studying that, like, how much of that are we really seeing out there in the marketplace, though? Like, we love these guys. And today, like, we're in, in, on Instagram consuming all these guys' stuff. But, like, what's the demand? We, don't, we didn't see enough of it in children's books or in publications. You'd see the occasional weekly standard and the occasional editorial spot. But you really weren't seeing as much, as it, much of it as we wanted to. And so that probably opened our minds at that time to, like, maybe that's something we will always do and will always be a part of us but that mm-hmm. started to just separate just a little bit and go like what where is the demand right now in the marketplace at least for where we were in central ohio at the time mm-hmm. and what do we really want to do that's how we think and that's how we came up and that's how we're wired and we love the exaggeration but we just weren't seeing as much of it as we wanted to and so we started opening our minds to other things at that time and um so let me yeah. stop. Let me stop you right there. Um, we're we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about how Corey broke away from caricature into other fields. So we'll be right back. Hey, thanks for watching Famous When I'm Dead podcast. This episode and all future episodes are going to be available on any one of your favorite podcast apps. I'll also be making all of my interviews from last year available as we move forward. This podcast is free for you to listen to, but it is not free for me to produce. Currently, it's about $140 a month to produce this podcast if and I hope I can keep my video editor. So I want to give a shout out to the patrons, uh, Tom Lambert and Lynn Davis at the $10 level, Chance McGee at the $5 level, you can find him on Instagram at Chance McGee Kunst. If you are still listening at this point, chances are that you do get value out of this podcast. If you are able to and you want to show us some love, be sure to pop over to our Patreon page. It's uh, Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash famous when I'm dead. The link will be in the description below. If you're strapped for cash and you still want to show us some love and support, Um, Make sure that you share the podcast with friends, family. Maybe you have students that might be interested in hearing the stories of these professional artists. So make sure you go to Instagram uh, at famous underscore when underscore I'm underscore dead and stay up to date on all the new exciting stuff we got going on. Thanks for watching and be sure to leave us a thumbs up and a comment below. Okay, we're back with Corey Hubble. And we're talking about caricature uh, and how he implements that into his practice today. Um, Before you go on, I I actually want to just relate to that because um, I dedicated 10 years. Um, I have a thing where uh, I jump around. I'm so interested in so many different things. So 
Uh, I have to make like really strict dedications to myself in order to follow through with things. And I mm. would have definitely went through to the 10 years if COVID wouldn't happen, but I reached about seven and a half years on that. Um, but now I got to just, I got to move into a different area. But uh, so w- what about you? Like you, you realized that it wasn't necessarily going to be a uh, lifetime sustainable thing or, and you decided to move into something like expand your horizons. Well, I was always like, I was always hustling, like even going back to when I was 15 before college and where we are in the story, like my mom, uh, learned how to do like faux finishing and like the textured painting on people's walls to make them look like marble or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she was very entrepreneurial. She's a recording artist and singer, and she would always have these like side hustles. Right. And I saw that growing up too. That was another thing that informed kind of the way that I, I thought, well, anyway, as she would get hired to do this faux finishing in people's homes, she would say, oh, my son does art. And they'd be like, great, could he do Dora the Explorer or SpongeBob on my kid's room wall, right? So at 15 years of age, she was teaching me how to deal with customers, how to create invoices, how to set my own schedule. Right. So then fast forward a little bit, I'm with Patrick O'Connell doing caricatures at restaurants. Like I've always... I've always just had that more entrepreneurial mindset, but then getting us back to where we were in the story and yeah, realizing it sounds that, like you had the call to action, which was like, okay, you like caricatures, but that might not be the best yeah. thing to keep going with forever. But it was already firmly planted in my mind that I will always be able to do that on the side. Like I kind of was like, okay, if I'm ever low on funds, I can just take an easel to the town square and just crank out a couple hundred caricatures and make some side money. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and that, that's something for the, for the listeners too. It's like, God, it's such a great feeling, right? Like you, you just like, it is. so many times I thought about it, it just never got old. Like when I grabbed the paper and I grabbed the markers, I'm like, this is all I need to conquer the world. <laughs> yeah. And my brother's two years younger than me. And he said this to me when I was like in my late twenties, he's like, I think you forget Corey, how valuable that is. Like not everybody has something that they can do like that. Yeah. And here I am. I I mean, I've grown up with the guy and he's bringing it to my attention and I'm going, that is a really good point. Like there, there aren't, there aren't a lot of those things. I mean, that's more common now because the gig, gig economy has blown up and people, if you have a car, you can go do Uber and whatever. But but it did. It, fe- it felt empowering, you know? Yeah, um, it's funny that the caricatures is what you fell back on, you know? Usually they're like, oh, you need to learn how to do pipe fitting or something. And you're like, oh, my fallback is caricature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so now I'm trying to think about the market with an illustration degree from a four-year art college. And um, I had a five-month-old. So I eloped my sophomore year of college and had a five-month-old at my college graduation. How old were you? I was 21. Ooh, so, wow. so yeah, this will start early. to, yeah, this will start to separate me from, from others in that I had a family to think about. So while my friends could have lived this bohemian, like I'm going to try to sell my work in galleries or I'm going to up and move to LA to try to get in the character design or concept art or gaming or entertainment industry. I was like, that's great. I've got to buy formula. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my first job and the people there were great, but I hated it, man. I did infographics for eight years. Eight years. Wow. So I did pie charts and org charts and timelines for 1500 page government proposal responses for eight years. Did you do any animated infographics? <laughs> Nothing. It was just straight up. Oh, man. Boring infographics but at the same time i was always doing my freelance thing so i was always doing caricatures i was always doing logo designs and i would i never let that die and this is an important thing i want to bring up for your listeners because it is about em- empowering the artists like too often we fall into dualism or dualistic thinking where we're like either you find a soul sucking corporate job that finds you working in a gray cubicle or you have a career you absolutely love doing exactly and only the type of art that you want to make and you write a unicorn to your studio yeah i just think that's such an unhealthy spectrum to paint because there's a bunch in the middle there that we 
especially if you're a young artist considering whether or not you should pursue a field in the arts like the the well-meaning people in your life will try to create that extreme those extremes and that leaves out a lot of stuff in the middle yeah yeah another thing about that too is that this concept that if you follow your passion it's going to be like you'll never work a day in your life, you know, that's the common one. But it, yeah. the reality yeah. is, is like even following the passion when it, when it has to, like when it's something that you're using to make money on, there's going to be parts of it that you don't like. And generally yeah. creative people generally don't like executive type things, you know, bureaucratic stuff. Yeah. So, but even if you find a manager or even if you find like a platform like the one we're building, it's like that it's going to manage a certain amount of it, but you still have to do that stuff. So it's never going to be, you know, strawberries and orgasms, you know, like you have to. You have <laughs> There's to, a T-shirt design, man. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but the yeah, other so thing too so, is like when you get good at things, that's the last thing I want to say. And the point I was actually getting at was like when you get good, like when you start to get proficiency, then you like it a little more, you know, and then you get that pushes you to do a little bit better and then you like it more. And then, then when it becomes instinctual and when it becomes like intuitive to make drawings, then it's just like you get into that flow and it's like, there's nothing better than that, you know? Because both scenes that I just painted there aren't real. Mm -hmm. The soul sucking gray corporate job. And I heard your story when you talked to chance and the lady pulling you like six inches face to face. (laughs) And it's like, you got to get out of here. Like, I feel that. Yeah. Um, But like the riding the unicorn to your studio isn't real either. Like at some point you're going to have to deal with difficult customers. And so either either story is a fallacy. But as another quick anecdotal example, getting right to the heart of the issue we're discussing now and another plus one for mentors. um, uh, Junior or senior year, there was a local illustration studio that came in to talk to the CCAD illustration students and they said, hey, we're a local studio. If you want to come by, we'd love to give you a tour of our um, tour of our studio and maybe check out your portfolio. And they talked to multiple illustration classes. So some odd weeks later, I reached out to Jim Theodore, who was leading um, the Artifact Group was the name of the studio at the time. And by the way, look up Jim Theodore's illustrations. They're phenomenal. Um, this is another one of my Obi-Wans. So a couple weeks later, I, I reached out and said, hey, you know, you made this offer to my illustration classmates and I'd love to take you up on that. Can I pop by the studio sometime? And I did. And he showed me around and dude, I was blown away. They had huge Mac screens and they had action figures. They were doing toy designs and packaging design. And I was like in love. Right. And uh, then he shared something that truly dumbfounded me. Uh, he goes, you know, you're the only student that took us up on our offer to come and tour our, our, our studio. We talked to 75 illustration kids who were about ready to graduate. Hmm. And you're the only person that took us up on our offer. Would you like to, can we start sending you some work? And I'm like, that's awesome. I'm like, yeah. So I, I'm not special. Like I didn't do anything crazy. I just listened to the guy who was where I wanted to be and took them up on their offer. And then I started realizing that there was almost two like camps of my classmates and the ones that didn't want to sell out to the man and the ones that were like, whatever I do isn't the only place I'm finding fulfillment. I can do things on the side or I have other passions and hobbies, but there was almost this like idea that got created that if you do anything like that, you're selling out. Mm. God, that that's, Wow. That, that was definitely in my school as well. And that's such a, where does that come from? That's so strange. So, so it's delusional. To, yeah, it is, it is. But I think it's important, especially for people, you know, considering a, uh, a career in the field or finding themselves at art college, like you have to fight against that. Again, there's a whole lot of stuff in the middle you could do. So I'm, I buy Jim Theodore a burger one day and I'm asking him a ton of questions. What should I charge for logos? How do I work with customers? Should I get an agent? All this stuff. Well, before you continue, I want to, I want to talk about that point because you brushed yeah. over that. And I think that that's really important. What you just said there that you bought him a burger. And so, yeah. and, and then you went to lunch with him and you asked him questions like for people out there, 
you know, artists who are looking to move fields or young artists who are looking to get into something, find somebody that you love their work, you respect them and buy them a meal. <laughs> and they're more accessible than you realize. Yeah. I've reached out to Gary Locke. I've reached out to, uh, uh, Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his name right now. His books. I reached out to Drew Struzan. Like I've reached out to all these like really well known illustrators, and they're they're pretty accessible. They're just geeks at a drawing desk, uh, drawing table, just like we are, right? What was the so, first person you reached out to? Um, Gary Locke. Okay. Uh, Gary Locke did a lot of those like really exaggerated Coca Cola illustrations for Sports Illustrated for kids, like the guy Duncan and the the stream of Coca Cola behind him and all oh, that, okay. right? Nice. Um, so anyways, so I'm in this soul sucking corporate job to use the, the vernacular I described earlier. And I'm just hating these infographics, man. Like I'm, I feel like my creative soul is dying, <laughs> even though I'm still doing fun stuff on the side for supplemental You're just income. moving circles around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Not I was another still doing circle, fun... no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I was still doing the fun stuff on the side and I buy Jim this burger and I had been freelancing for his studio for a while at this point. And I'm like whining. I'm like, all my friends went to Pixar and EA games and they're doing fun concept art and character designs and I'm doing infographics and he just starts laughing. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, Jim, I don't think you understand what I'm saying here. Like, this is painful. Like, I feel like I've sold out and all my friends are doing this cool stuff. And he he used this illustration with me, no pun intended. He said, imagine a ladder and rung one, the very first rung on that ladder is paying your bills. And rung two on that ladder is like your two to five year goals, like kind of maybe what you're doing with Draw Some or what Nolan Harris is doing with Over the Line Art, stuff like that. And then oh, like... I'm, d I'm doing Sketcharium, Manny Avetisian's doing Draw Some. Okay, Draw yeah, Some, I yeah, Sketcharium, all that. Like those kind of like cool th things that you're building. Or And then rung three of that ladder is like your long term, like maybe you want to retire and be a woodworker, but always do art on the side, right? Like you want to build a really cool wood shop, whatever. Yeah, yeah. He's like, it sounds to me like what you're describing is that you have the perfect situation. And I said, well, what do you, what do you mean? And he goes, so what you're saying is your boring corporate job doing these infographics is paying all your bills, right? Yeah. And you clock out at five every day, right? And you leave that behind, right? Yeah. So what do you want to do? And at the time, I was obsessed with, and still am, Fraser Davidson and his athletic logos. And I, some of the samples I sent you of my stuff is very reminiscent of that. Um, but he goes, okay, so let's say you want to do these athletic, athletic logos. You have the freedom to do that in your spare time in the evenings because you aren't, you aren't dependent upon making income from that endeavor. So you can build a really rich portfolio of exactly that type of work and then go market yourself doing that because you're not worried about the income because the boring job's taking care of that. Yeah, yeah. He's like, you got to realize like your buddies that you're comparing yourself to who are out there, he's like, when you factor in cost of living, they're making the equivalent of a teacher's salary working 80 hours a week. Yeah. He's like, this, this is apples and oranges, man. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, whoa. And that, bro, that changed everything. Yeah, because, God, they're grinding so hard in those studios, man. Like, like you said, 60 to 80 hours a week. That's a no lot kind of, of them life. were hamsters on a wheel. And I think at the time, EA was getting in trouble for like overworking their employees and stuff. Like that's when all that went down. So that totally changed my perspective. And it is that corporate job that I didn't like that led to what I'm doing now as a graphic facilitator for Amazon, specifically Amazon Web Services, where pre-COVID, I got to travel the world illustrating live while executives talk, drawing on the walls what they're talking about and still doing whatever I want on the side as long as I'm still honoring my primary commitments with the day job, which is, is I'm like, what else would have afforded me the opportunity to travel the world and draw on walls during meetings? Yeah, yeah. Like, and it hit me when we got invited to do some consulting with DreamWorks out in Burbank, like at their studios. And they invited me and a few of my colleagues out to do some, 
some structured visual thinking, graphic facilitation, scribing, whatever you want to call it. It's just mm -hmm. facilitating meetings with leaders and helping them create a vision and using images that come to life as the mechanism through which to do that. And I'm like, you know what? I probably wouldn't have ended up here at DreamWorks on my illustration skills alone following the character design path. But yeah. I'm here now as a graphic facilitator. And at the time we were Hewlett Packard Enterprise. But but yeah, I'm like, this is this is so cool, man. Like, yeah, you know, and, and I just felt very fortunate that I didn't stop or think that I was on the wrong path. Like I just kept putting one foot in front of the other and trying to get closer to my love of illustration and storytelling. And that has now yielded this career that I still try to convince my mom and dad is a real job. <laughs> well, let me ask you, do you, uh, you were, you were doing like sports team illustrations. Mm -hmm. Have you ever met a guy named Tom Lambert? Oh yeah. I've I've not met him, but I've heard the name. You know, Tom Lambert that he is my uncle. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. He's like, uh, he's an in-law. He's my aunt's hus new husband. Yeah. yeah. I love that athletic branding, man. And I think, you know, now that I'm in a situation similar to what I described to Jim Theodore that day, like I'm in kind of a similar situation, like the bills are taken care of. So I'm rediscovering what I want Hubble Arts to be in this new chapter. And I'm story branding myself to go like, what do I really want to do most? The bills are taken care of. Thank you, Jesus. Like, what do I really want to do most? And my love of branding and identity work, and especially as it relates to athletic and sports stuff, is very strong. And I think Fraser Davidson paved the way years ago. I think a lot of people are copying him now. You mean um, the guy who wrote the story, uh, our uh, sketch, sketch noting? Is that him? No, Fraser Davidson is the athletic branding guy. So he does oh. uh, like for ESPN and all these sports teams. A lot of people have mimicked that style, especially on spec spec sites. Like they're just straight up copying him. Mm -hmm. But I love it because they're they're longer term projects. They pay really well. I've done it for a handful of high schools now, and my goal is to do it for a Division One college team. Um, but I'm just having a lot of fun with that. And, um, so let me, let me I ask still, you that that's, yeah. you're doing the, you're doing this branding, uh, brand identity stuff for sports teams. And then mm -hmm. you're also doing the, uh, graphic facilitation. Yeah. And then I still, I still like caricature, but I'm really out of practice with the live ones. So mm -hmm. I really prefer to do studio ones like now, like if people want an avatar for their social media profiles and, like I said, I think what Nolan Harris is doing with Over the Line Art and, and what you're doing with Sketcharium and um, and what they're doing with Drawsome, like those are fun. Those are great ways for people to like pivot into a side hustle slash career on a platform such as that, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could get a team of people and hey, upload your photo and we'll send you back a caricature. So I, I still like to do that. Um, but... Yeah, I'm I'm out of practice as it relates to Yeah, well, it sounds like you get a lot of that through your graphic facilitation. So um, I did want to ask a quick question. Uh, no, I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to skip All that right. one because we're, we're running low on time. Um, yeah, okay. All right, before we get to questions from fans, I want to ask you a little bit about graphic facilitation. So yeah, I am really surprised that I heard about that just now because yeah. it's like, it's kind of like as a caricature artist, a live caricature artist, it's like, how is it possible that I didn't hear about this career? <laughs> I had a friend who is like dealing with, you know, really wealthy people and he mentioned it to me, but he didn't say that word graphic facil facilitation. And I had no idea yeah. it was like an industry. So yeah, what about that? Like, how did you learn that? So I was, I was doing that infographic job at, at the time we were Hewlett Packard and they used to bring in this group called group partners out of the UK. It was a guy, John Caswell, um, who created this idea of structured visual thinking where you would sit with executives to help them either cast a vision or bring alignment in their organization or whatever with the use of large scale images. And HP would hire, bring him in to like close big deals with their top customers. And HP said, we can build this internally. 
And John Caswell said, you'll never make it. You'll never make it work. And but but he sold them the IP. And so Hewlett Packard started building this in house and they started reaching out to the org saying, like, are you good with markers? Are you comfortable drawing live? Are you good with people? Like, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is me. <laughs> like, um, and that's how I heard about it uh, through HP building it in house for their top customers. And so um, I've been doing it for six years now. And I, I absolutely have a blast doing it. Like I said, I've literally gotten to go places across the globe that I never would have gone otherwise. And now I feel like I have this golden ticket where I can bring my friends along and reach out to my illustrator buddies. Yeah. Sam, you'd be surprised at the people who are like, they want nothing to do with that because it just reeks of. Oh yeah. Selling out. Yeah. Selling out. And I'm like, it doesn't have to be your everything. Like it yeah. pays really, really, really well. Like do your side hustle in your spare time, but I get it. They don't, they don't want to do that. And you know, they, there is, there's just like this bohemian attitude of like, not that they're too good for it, but in some ways I'm like the anti-success story, right? Like the stories we love to hear are, I had a great corporate job and I left it to paint landscapes. And those are the stories (laughs) we love as artists. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like the anti-success story in that regard. The anti-hero. (laughs) <laughs> yeah so i mean maybe that's we call this episode how to sell out with Corey. yeah Hubble. oh my god you got it that's gonna that's the title <laughs> no joke how to sell out oh that's great man <laughs> um yeah i'm i'm really excited about it. i just actually signed up for a course on motion design through school of motion and i i've been learning after effects deeper now with that so i'm gonna definitely that's definitely the main path that i'm going down but I've been in contact with a woman here who does graphic facilitation in Prague yeah. and I'm yeah. getting the book and man, that book is like hard to get here in Prague, but I'm going to probably, I'm going to order it today. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to learn it, man. I'm going to learn that along with, with the motion design because dude, I already do that. I are, that's already yeah, what I do. I'm, it's it's fascinating and and I know it's a it's a it's totally exploding. I know Chance is doing some of it, so I'll give you a, a few resources for those of your listeners that are interested in learning more about it. Where I really saw it for the first time was on YouTube, a series of videos called RSA Animate. Uh-huh. Um, and the company that did the, the probably the best one is called. Um, Paradigms in Education by RSA Animate. Check that one out as like an introduction to the concept. Um, but paradigms the, in the what? Paradigms in Education, oh. RSA Animate. If you if you type that into YouTube. Oh, I think I've watched that, but I'm gonna I'll I'll look it up again. But I remember that one being really good. So the studio that did that is called Cognitive, and I think they're out of the UK. But they were they were um, hired on to do a lot of those videos for um, for that organization. Um, there are a couple TED talks on the subject. So Rachel Smith is probably one of the foremost graphic recorders, graphic facilitators. Um, she kind of talks about it as a practice. There have been articles in the Wall Street Journal about it now. I mean, it's it's uh, significant. What you'll find, and I don't want to disparage either camp and here I am going and painting that dualistic picture that I talked about earlier you'll find that there are how do I say this in a sensitive way professional do you don't, you don't professional have to be doodlers <laughs> you know what you do when you're on the phone with somebody and you're just yeah. kind of doodling there are people who maybe don't have strong drawing skills who have made very successful careers out of it <laughs> is that political on that one <laughs> And then you'll find a series of people who are more classically trained and are pivoting into that industry. And so neither one is bad. You can succeed in either. But like what Chance showed me the other day, the video that he created, the little time-based thing that he did for a company, I was like, bro, like this is phenomenal. So yeah, yeah. He's, his quality is just, uh, uh, you know, on another level. But it's more than just, I jokingly tell people when I'm on planes and stuff that I'm a professional doodler. 
It really is more than that. It's about being able to tell stories, being able to create a visual hierarchy with your illustrations, not giving everything the same level of importance or weight. And that's what I see a lot of the people who came up on the graphic recording side doing a lot of. Like everything kind of looks the same and they've learned how to draw a person holding a flag, a person standing in front of a building, a person sitting on a chair. But if a customer says something like, you know, our organization, it's like we're a rhinoceros surfing trying to spin plates. I think it's significantly more valuable if you can do that live when they say that than just having memorized a certain icon set. Um, but yeah. anyway, um, God bless them. I just, I just, I think it's a different, it's a different track. Um, so, so yeah, it's a lot of fun and it's, it's crazy how much it's growing. And, um, another one, so I, I mentioned the cognitive, the ones that did the RSA animate videos, regardless of your spiritual beliefs, I would check out the Bible project. They're a studio out of Portland that illustrates the books of the Bible and then concepts out of the Bible. So the concept of justice or the concept of holiness, they do beautiful illustrations. The ones where they encapsulate the books of the Bible on like a textured papyrus paper with live ink illustrations. It's, it's amazing stuff. So oh. check out the Bible project for sure. Cool. Cool. Any other big ones? Uh, those are like so for resources uh, after here. school, after school with a K uh, oh, yeah, is another YouTuber. He does like Joe Rogan talks and stuff illustrated live. Um, so that's kind of a fun one after school with a K, but yeah, I just started consuming all this stuff and, um, learned a lot from watching people that are, that, that were sort of leading the industry. So we'll take another quick break and we'll come back with fan questions and rapid fire questions. Right on. We'll be right back. Have you heard of drawsome.com? Of course you haven't because it hasn't officially launched yet. But I have talked to Manny Abitizian, the founder, about it in detail, and it's going to be awesome. The Drawsome app is an exciting new platform that's coming soon for artists and art lovers that is going to change the game. It's a creative social marketplace where artists can post their artwork, receive commissions, and even turn each post into a print-on-demand product that's drop-shipped directly to your customers. That means people can choose if they want your design on a print, mug, t-shirt, whatever, and you don't have to deal with the printing or shipping. You want some of that, don't ya? Hop on over to drawsome.com, that's D-R-A-W-S-O-M-E.com, and sign up to be the first to receive updates and news as soon as it's launched in iOS, Android, and web. Okay, we're back, and let's talk, uh, well, let's just do the, the fan questions. First one is from Chance McGee. That's Chance McGee Kunst on Instagram if you want to look him up. How do you decide how much of your creative energy to give to your projects and how much to save for your personal work? Or, more generally, how do you balance personal projects with client work? Oof, good question. and. To add to the complexity, I have that third layer of the day job, right? So that I've fully committed to that, and that that has to to get that amount of my time. You still have, you're but, still working with HP? Uh, it's actually Amazon now, Amazon oh, Web Services. Okay. So that parlayed into well, that evolved rather into into that. But um, so with what's left over, I think Chance, like as a perfectionist. And somebody who always wants to under promise and under and over deliver for my customers. Under promise and I would over always and under deliver. <laughs> yeah. I would always do way too much. Um, especially if you have an iterative process where you're starting with conceptual sketches for the customer. I would put way too much time into those. And what I learned, especially with my logo process, now when I sit with customers, like I'll do really rough, ugly napkin sketches. Mm -hmm. And because they've seen my finished work. I mean, it mm -hmm. speaks for itself. If they want to hire me, they already know that. So I don't need to impress them with the iterative stuff. Mm -hmm. So do that quick and dirty. Like I would look at a lot of like even ma rough magazine layouts that some of my caricature hero uh, heroes would do. It was like really rough. 
uh, just to get the art director to see what they were thinking. So my mm-hmm. only advice chance would be like major in the majors, don't major in the minors. Like <laughs> if you can work rough and iterative and your customer knows kind of where you're headed and in, then, then don't waste time in those phases. Spend that time on the back end with the near final or the final. Um, mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then you should have, in theory, you should have more time left over for the personal stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's a good answer. Okay, Christy Klein asks, I would ask what advice you have for young artists who want to have a career in the arts, pretty general, but well-meaning people try to sway them into pursuing other fear fields. So often I see young artists being told they won't be able to support themselves in the art field. Yeah, we, I mean, we kind of hit on it um, earlier in the interview, but but yeah, just I would tell the young person, get around people who are doing what you think you want to do first, because because whether or not you can make money in a creative field to me is the wrong question. We have this scarcity uh mentality where it's like there aren't creative features. No, there are. They're out there. And guess what? There are a lot more than you realize. Like Mm -hmm. every car, every forklift, every ironing board starts with a concept artist and a designer. Like yeah. Like you don't see that, but it is a part of the ideation and the and and the the conceptualizing process. So the fields exist. That's not the right question. In my opinion, it's what do you want to do? What's the market value for that thing? Get around people who are in that industry or are close to that industry and ask a ton of questions and then make an honest assessment of your own work and how it holds up to the work in that industry. And like so many people at our school were young girls, especially who just drew anime characters on lined paper. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of professors that were like, that's great but what else? (laughs) Like they were too narrow too quickly. And, um, the concern was that they wouldn't be able to find a job in that specific niche area. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I would just, I would just take a look at what's out there. Look at the market value, do a, do an honest assessment of your work and get around people who are in that industry succeeding because, you know, God love your well-meaning family members and friends, but, Everybody has an opinion, mm-hmm. and um, I would look at the fruit on the tree, the fruit on their tree, before considering that that advice. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's a good good visual. <laughs> yeah the the thing about the other thing I want to just add to a part of what you said there was there is this phase where people have to kind of go through usually um, where they they try a bunch of stuff out. Um, I would, you know, to kind of figure out what they do want to do, like if they don't quite know that yet. And what I would say to that is write down what you think you're good at, what other people tell you that you're good at, and spend some time. There's plenty of resources like exploring like really what your, not what your talents are, but what your gift is. Like, yeah. What the, what is the core of your gift? Are you do you make people feel comfortable? Do you make people laugh? Like uh, do people are you able to coach people really well? Like what is the, what is that gift? And start from there. And that, then that's a great go, point. Yeah, and then when you go out and you're asking people, uh, you know what you're doing is you're basically getting lots of experience without having to go through all that experience. And then once you find something that seems like instinctually right, like it, it pulls together the talents and the skills and the gifts all together, even if it's not 100%, let's say it's like 90% or something, then just make a commitment to do that yeah. for like five years. Just say, I'm going to do this for five or 10 years. I'm going to get really good at it. I'm going to, because the thing is, is like when you master one thing, you learn how to master anything. Yeah. So those principles are the same. You know, they can be applied to, I mean, whether it's jujitsu or, you know, caricature drawing, you know. That's a great point, and I'm glad you brought it up. It kind of goes back to Chance's question, like, pull out what your differentiated value is. Like, when I look at other artists, and I remember having a conversation with my CCAD buddy, A.G. Ford, who I referenced earlier, and he's hands down a better illustrator than I am. 
But he said to me when I was watching him work on the last page of one of the books for his clients, I was like, oh, it would have much, been a much, much better ending if you would have wrapped it up this way. And he stopped me and he goes, see, Corey, that's it right there. Like, I could paint, I could paint circles around you, but you're a better storyteller. And, and so I started recognizing the value of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And to Chance's question about, like, how do you figure out, like, how to, where to spend your time? I just had a, a UX designer from a pretty well-known corporation reach out and ask me to do some illustrations. And after 15 minutes on the qualifying call with him, I actually said, I think my greatest value to you, customer, is on the, like, branding and identity system, storytelling side. We might have somebody else execute the illustrations. I knew I could do it. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to be honest with him that the most value I thought I could bring wasn't actually in the illustration. And mm -hmm. so they're going to pay me for creative consulting work on the front end. So that's yeah. like, that's a better fit. So I, I love what you said, Sam, about like really parsing out the, the, the differentiated value that you bring. Yeah. And, you know, th this is these are, I'm just passing on information that was passed on to me. And I, but I think that that is a good thing to do for a lot of artists now who are in this place where they just don't know where to go forward. I mean, yeah. for me, I kind of held out for as long as I could until it became, you know, painfully obvious that I have to pivot, you know? So, yeah. All right. So the next question, Harrison Wild, God bless your parents for naming you that. What an awesome name. Harrison. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Is there a certain practice that helped you improve more than any other kind of practice when it came to improving your art? Um, so I know Harrison Do pretty it. well. Do it now. Do it now. <laughs> yeah. <up. laughs> uh, that's a great Arnold, by the way. Um, I would just say reference. It's really simple, but it was drilled into us at art school. Reference photos, man. It's not cheating. Yeah. Unless you're tracing. That's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> reference photos. Reference photos. You can't learn anything by drawing out of your head all the time. Yeah. And so gather reference. It, with my kids, like my, my oldest daughter is 14 and she's got some really good like drawing skills. I won't let her draw even a very oversimplified cartoon character without getting reference first. Mm -hmm. I'm like reference, reference, reference. You learn so much about anatomy and lighting and and it's, it's so important. Um, when I do these athletic mascot designs, I'll look up 400 pictures of bulldogs before I even start sketching anything. So I just think reference is important. Sketch, draw all the time. Um, yeah, but reference. I'm going to quote Stephen Silver. A page a day keeps the competition away. Yeah. Chris Payne used to say, we all have bad drawings in us. It's important that we get them out so that we can get to the good ones. Yeah. And as a perfect perfectionist, even in my sketchbook, I've crossed out things or torn out pages. And I'm like, bro, this is a sketchbook. That, this is literally what this is for. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Carol Renee Jarvis. Did anyone get really angry when they saw your caricature of them? This is one of those questions that like every caricature artist hears a thousand times. <laughs> we should, you should, you've probably already done this, but you should do like a, a segment on all the cliche things that people utter over your shoulder while you're drawing caricatures. Yeah. I, I guess I've seen so many of those comics. I'm like, ah, I'm just burnt out on that. <laughs> um, not the, the worst that's ever happened to me. I'd love to hear your story, Sam, but the worst that's ever happened is somebody goes, that doesn't look like me, but I've never had somebody be like offended or upset, which might mean I'm playing it too safe. What I love about your work, Sam, is that you're not afraid to really exaggerate and push uh, the, the features. The one that you did of Chance where his eyes are like <laughs> on either side of and below his lips is like, see that I never got that bold. So um, yeah. maybe I've been playing it safe for too long. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think that I've all of my rejects or all of my yeah, all of them have been when I played it safe. I've never had one where it was like, well, that's not true. That's not true. I've had have, have had people reject them, but but definitely like when I play it safe, it's worse. Like 
my my approach is like shock and and then like is first kind of like the shock because for me yeah. like or the surprise because for me that's what makes me burst out in laughter is like yeah. something completely unexpected you know and absurd absurdity you know yeah yeah. But if you've got examples up there, they already know what they're asking for when yeah. they sit down. So they know that this isn't going to be like a, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to flatter you here. This is like a, I'm going to jack you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've thought of some different names, like, uh, you know, some pretty like crude names, but like in your face, somebody already has in your face. Um, yeah. But anyway. So I came up with, cause it, it, it works with my name. I came up with Corey Kitchers. Ah, see, you got a golden. That's another golden ticket you got. See, that's so. Uh, that's a trademark <laughs> for Corey. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you about. Speaking of branding, let me ask you about your gear. On you have this hex thing. What's up with that? Oh, it's uh, it's he greater than I. Uh, so he greater than sign little I, which is ah. based off of John three thirty. He must increase and I must decrease. It's this really dope brand out of Hawaii that I fell in love with. So, um, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I thought that was your brand for a second. No, I wish. <laughs> That's a is it a Christian based brand? Is that yeah? The... yeah oh, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. So it's just a conversation starter. See, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um. Oh, well, we're a little over, but if you have time, we can do some rapid fire questions. Yeah, you made a mistake of having a talker on as a guest. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Okay. Now it's time for rapid fire questions. Okay. Uh, first one, stand up or skit comedy? Stand up. Me too. Last meal. Oh, uh, smoothie. I'm doing this juicing thing. I hate it. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean your last meal before you die. Oh, oh, uh, probably just a really good steak, potatoes and asparagus. Steak, potatoes and asparagus. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What book are you reading right now? Uh, the Gift of Being Yourself by David Benner. Okay. Okay, nice. Uh, your favorite new band or musician? Oh, Mark Rebier. Uh, he does these improv loops, like two hour three hour improv improv loops it's amazing wait a second is it like does he have glasses and he's got like glasses and a mustache and long hair and he's real that's weird how you pronounce like, it rebier rebier yeah he's got a his dad is french Dude, he is the funniest human being oh my i love <laughs> like if i'm in a bad mood i just find him dude and I get so productive when I have him on in the background. It's like funk and soul and oh man, I, people don't people online though don't know how to take him because they think he's joking and then they go, oh, he's like phenomenally talented. Yeah, playing piano and singing. The dude is insane. Also, I just discovered Marcus King. Uh, so Marcus King band, check them out. Oh my gosh, the dude can sing. Uh. I, I, it's funny. I didn't expect you to say Mark Ribier because, like, he's just so crude. Like, the, he's the, weird and crude. I, I know. I love. I just love that. That he's like the perfect comedian musician mix. It's like the perfect, uh, uh, like, expression of my personality. Like, that's my he, humor. Exactly. He tours on my podcast. We just talked about. What are all the weird things you do when you're home alone, like when you finally have the house to yourself? He's like the embodiment of what you would do if you had those skills and had the house to yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I almost bought a MIDI controller and a keyboard because of him. The Loop uh, Daddy. So you're trapped on an island and you can bring one object. What is it? Is it cheating to say a, like a, a Leatherman, which is multiple tools in one? <laughs> No, you can say that. I don't know what what's that. What's a leatherman? It's like it's like an extreme Swiss Army knife, like a leatherman or a multi tool. They have a saw and a knife, and a some of them have flints and toothpicks and scissors and. Okay, pulp. well, what if what if you had one of those and you can bring a, a non essential item? What would you bring? Uh, man, that's a great question. A Mark Rebier album. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Can I say technology? If I, there's no chargers, I just want to draw. I just want an iPad. I just want to yeah. draw with my Apple Pencil. <laughs> but you won't be able to share it with anybody. It would just be all all for Fine. you. Fine. It's cathartic. I need you it. You could get the the Skynet or whatever the Starlink, the Elon Musk Starlink. Yeah. But then you wouldn't be able to bring your iPad because you'd have the Starlink. Right. Okay, so uh, you had a billion dollars. What would you do with it? I feel like I got to bring these questions up earlier. These are big questions. Man, these are big ones. Uh, probably something boring and benevolent. There's a lot of people in need. So, um, <laughs> and you know, after I after I had lived like a, a pretty cool year of buying all the toys, I've always delayed gratification on. Then I just give the rest away. Yeah, it's funny. Nobody ever says I would invest like half of it so it would like continue to grow and I can just like continue to like keep that money going forever and ever and ever. People are always like, I would spend all of this and then I would start this or do this. Like people always think about how they would spend it. They never think about how they would renew it. Yeah, I think Chance tried and you told him that he he had to spend it. Like he said, I would invest. And then you're like, no, you got to spend it. A billion's a big number though. If you said a million, like... You'd spend you'd spend so much and have a ton left over with a billion. With a yeah, million, that goes quicker than it used to. That's why when he said I would start an animation studio, I'm like, dude, what kind of animation <laughs> studio is that? And bring everyone over from Pixar. All right, you okay? I'm gonna skip that one. We gave a lot of good advice already on that one. Yeah. You have one week to live. What do you do with the week? Everybody says family, right? Spend yeah. time with family. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to steal chances. I've always had this desire to write a book to each of my children of the things that those mentors we've described have taught me. And I have mentors in my spiritual life. I have mentors in my art, like all those things that I learned from my dad, my grandpa, you know, those old, you know, old school, like open a door for a lady, which is a, probably offensive now. You're probably not allowed to do that anymore. Um, <laughs> but like all of those just Midwestern like sentimentalities and, and lessons learned and treat people right. And I want to do these really personalized books for each of my kids. So I'd have to accelerate that plan. Wow, that's pretty awesome. I mean, I suppose the always the follow up question after people answer that one is like, what's stopping you from doing it now? You don't have I, to answer I that. You, you I don't convince have to myself that. that I have more time than a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's wrap up. How can like you want to tell somebody or tell the people about what you're doing now or how they can find you? Yeah, for sure. Um, so at Hubble Arts on Facebook and Instagram. I don't know what the next chapter of Hubble Arts is going to look like, but I'd love to invite you to to check out what I've done up to this point and see what that's going to become. Um, as you mentioned at the top, uh, I have a podcast with my brother and uh, the worship leader at my church. We've been going for two years. And uh, so check out at From the Mid Pod everywhere. That's From the Middle. And we've had on, uh, like I said, A.G. Ford, New York Times bestselling children's book illustrator, and I was mentioning on the break that for some reason Tom Richmond has agreed to to come on and be a guest. So and you had the I'm comedian. Out. What was that comedian you yeah, had? Yeah, Kellen Erskine is uh, one of my new favorite comedians that I saw in an Amazon documentary called Inside Jokes that follows a handful of comedians going to the Just for Laughs festival. New faces of comedy, um, I guess, set at the Just for Laughs festival. So if you don't know anything about stand up, like that's where the up and coming comics go to get discovered and it follows a handful of them and some of them make it and some of it don't. But Kellen was one that I fell in love with and he agreed to come on. So we, that's just like a catch all comedy culture, entertainment, dad, geek culture podcast. And we'd love for you to check out a handful of episodes. Yeah, that was a, that was a good one. That was funny. Yeah. So yeah, at Hubble arts and at from the mid pod, and uh, please do reach out. Like I love, I love talking with people, as you have heard. <laughs> um, so the other thing I will say, I have to mention this: I have a unique spelling of both my first and last name. Yeah. There is another Corey Hubble who spells it exactly like I do. He's the same age as me, and he's an illustrator. What? 
he's a concept artist and he's worked <laughs> on like Halo video games and stuff. So if you came here thinking that that's what you were going to get, I'm very sorry. I'm Corey Hubble, the lesser. Um, or I can name the episode Corey Hubble, not the one you're thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, we've crossed paths multiple times. There's so many funny stories. He worked at Amazon also. It's There's this whole crazy story. Anyway, that's Corey Lynn, L-Y-N-N Hubble. He's amazing. We've talked about doing a, a book, a coffee table book that's a collab. Like how fun would it be for my art to be when you look at the book one way and then his art when you look at it the other yeah, way. And yeah. then they meet in the middle. We have characters that are fighting. Like, yeah. It'd be called it'd be called Corey Hubble Squared. Yeah, exactly. Or the 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 Hubble's Corey or something like that. But yeah, so I'm not him. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint the guests. Uh, we'll have another episode coming out uh, in a couple weeks. I think I'm. Like, hey, I, I stay I'm... in touch. I stay in touch with him, so I can give you his contact info if that's who you were hoping for. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe that would be funny to have two Corey Hubbles, one right after the other. We're going to have him on our podcast and share some of those those stories of the instances where our paths have crossed. So. so we'll wrap it up, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks so much, Sam.